I'm a member of a couple of Facebook groups uh, for both the suburb in which I live and the suburb in which I work. And it's just an easy way to stay in touch with some of the things that are happening in our local community. Um, on both of those pages, um, in those different places, uh, people had been seen recently sleeping rough, which is not something that we normally see happening in our areas. And it was just great to see the way that people had responded. Um, rather than just passing comment, um, people had actually reported that they'd been down, that they'd checked in on these people, um, that they'd offered accommodation or they'd taken down a blanket or they'd offered food. They'd done something to help somebody who, for whatever reason, uh, was struggling in this season of life. Um, and it's just great to see when people do those sorts of things. It reminded me of a story that Jesus told. It's a really well-known story. And it's found in Luke chapter 10. Let me just uh, bring you up to speed on, on what was going on, the, the circumstances that Jesus told this story in. So this expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. He wanted to get Jesus into a, a philosophical or a legal debate. And he asked this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus responds, well, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And the man answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you'll live. But the man wasn't satisfied with that. He really wanted to engage Jesus in more of a detailed discussion on the nitty gritty of the law. So he asked a follow up question. Well, who is my neighbor? And that's when Jesus told this story. And you'd know it pretty well, I reckon. It's the story of a man who was travelling down to Jericho. And as he's travelling, he gets mugged. He gets beaten up. He's left naked and bleeding on the side of the road. Um, and shortly afterward, two people, both of them who are involved in the religious life of Israel, a Levite and a priest, they come travelling down the road at different times. But both of them move to the other side of the road and pass this guy by. But then somebody comes along, somebody who's not a part of the people of Israel, who doesn't have all of God's laws. He has kind of a mixed up religion where he has some of God's ways and some, some of the pagan ways all mixed in together. But he comes across this guy and he does what God has asked his people to do. He shows compassion, he shows care, he shows mercy. He shows qualities that actually reflect what God himself is like. And he pulls over and he picks the guy up, bandages his wounds, puts him on his donkey, takes him to the nearest town, pays for his accommodation and medicines and offers to pay any outstanding debts that might be accrued as the innkeeper looks after this guy's needs. Um, and it's a really interesting story that Jesus tells. And as I thought about that in a modern context, and I thought about the impulse that these people on those Facebook groups had demonstrated. And I don't know who those people are, but possibly they don't consider themselves religious. Yet they had this impulse to do what God asks people to do. And I wondered if there was any chance whether people who are identified as religious, like the priest and the Levite, like me, a pastor, or somebody who might attend church, whether we might actually find ourselves in the story as those who walk down the road and actually move to the other side and avoid doing the things that God asks us to do. Is it really possible that the world would be a better place without religion? Is it really true that we need God to tell us how to live in order to do what is right and good? These are the sorts of questions that people wrestle with. And it's the sort of question which is addressed in Matthew chapter 13. We've been working our way through the stories Jesus told about his kingdom and what it's meant to be like. And we get up to a story which is called the parable of the yeast. It's in Matthew chapter 13 and it's in verse 33. It simply says this, He, being Jesus, told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. That's a really short and simple story and you might not see at first how it relates to the situation that I've just described. But stop and think about that for a while with me. As you look at yeast and how it works, as Jesus described, you take a really small amount and work it through with a large amount of flour and then knead it in through the dough. And eventually you get a great loaf of bread or many loaves of bread. 
And as you knead that dough, as it's mixed in first with the flour and with all the other ingredients, the yeast soon disappears. It's only a small quantity that is needed. And as you look at the dough, you might not even realise that there's any yeast in it. Um, unlike flour, you can't feel it in the water and the oil and some of the other ingredients. You, you might not be able to tell by the texture and by the look that there's actually any yeast in there. But eventually you'll see the results because if there is yeast in there, that dough will rise and the bread will be fantastic. But if you take out that hidden ingredient, what are you going to be left with? You won't have a beautiful loaf of bread, you'll have a brick, you'll have something dense and heavy and not at all what it was meant to be. And the kingdom of heaven is meant to have that kind of impact on the world. It might not be something that you notice, it might not be something that you can see straight away, but you should be able to see the difference that it makes. It should make the world better. Well, is that our experience of how the kingdom of God has worked? As we rewind to the story of the Good Samaritan, we see people living by a certain set of rules. For example, the, the priest and the Levite, well, they had all of God's laws. They knew how God expected them to act. Yet, as they walked down the road, what were the rules they were actually living by in that moment? Was it the rule of look out for number one? Was it a rule like, hey, it's important to stay ceremonially pure. You don't want to touch a dead body. You don't want to defile yourself, especially if you're about to perform some sort of religious duty. Were there other rules that took priority over the many rules that God had given to show compassion and mercy and care for people? What were the rules that those two men were operating by in that situation? They weren't rules that led to a great result at least not for that person who was lying helpless on the side of the road. But then you take the Good Samaritan. What were the rules that he was living by in that moment? Well, we might uh, describe it as the golden rule. Treat others the way that you would like to be treated. Or it could be the very rule that Jesus had been discussing with that expert in the law. Love God with all your being. But what was the second part? Love others as yourself. To love your neighbour. This was a guy who, whether he meant to or not, was living by a value of the kingdom of heaven. A good rule to live by. It led to a great result in the life of that person. But what this story demonstrates is that having the rules alone isn't enough. After all, the priest and the Levite, they had all of God's rules that should have governed them toward acting in a right way. But yet, their lives didn't lead to great results. What's the hidden ingredient? What is it that makes all the difference in how things turn out? Well, according to Jesus, it's the relationship that we have with God and others. It's whether or not we are truly part of the kingdom of heaven. When you've been brought into a right relationship with God through faith in Jesus, when you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit who is in you, helping you to live by God's ways, when you not only know God's rules but want to obey them and are being empowered to obey them, then you have the capacity to make the world a better place. That's what Jesus is saying his kingdom will be like. His kingdom will be something that enables people to live in such a way that they make the world a better place. And how did that play out? When Jesus returned to heaven, when his kingdom grew, as more people found out about what he had done for them to reconcile them to God, to bring them into his family, as more people came to know him as Lord and Saviour, as more people received the gift of the Holy Spirit, how did the way that they were living their lives change? And what was the impact of that on the world? Well, it's really encouraging not only to read it in the Bible, but to look back in history and to see some of the ways that this played out. For example, in marriage and sexuality, you'll be aware of how the Bible teaches that God wants marriage and sexuality to be expressed in the context of a loving commitment between one man and one woman for life. Yet in the culture in which the early church was embedded, that wasn't the way things were done. In fact, uh, the man was the authority in the household and that household would often contain male and female slaves, both adult and children. And the way things worked in Roman society at that time was that the, the male figure, the father, the husband figure, not only was able to have sexual relationships with his wife, but also any of the slaves that were in his household. And it was normal for him to have sexual relationships with people outside his household as well. 
But for those who were in his household, those adults and children who were slaves, they had no choice about how he wanted to treat them in a sexual way. He had full rights over them. Just imagine living in a world like that. Imagine being a wife where your husband didn't see sex as an expression of loving relationship, of intimacy, as part of the whole picture of marriage where there is friendship and partnership and loyalty and mutual service and all of those things that God designed for marriage, but just saw it as a way to get his own physical needs met. And he did that with whomever he chose. What a degrading and an unpleasant situation to be a part of. Yet, when people came to know Jesus as Lord and Saviour, when they came to know his standards for how he wanted marriage and sexuality to be expressed, their behaviour started to change. It changed in ways that were good for everybody, good for marriages, good for those who were a part of households, good for society. Marriage and family became a more sacred and stable and a blessed thing for those who participated in them. That was just one way that living by God's ways made a huge difference in the lives of people as people began to live according to them. But there were many other ways as well. For example, if you look at health care or education or social welfare, if you look back in the history of uh, the Western civilization and see how Christians have taken the lead in each of these ways, um, it's been amazing. And if you go to any Christian bookstore or search online to look for Christian biographies, uh, just recently um, our ladies group studied the life of Graham Staines, an Australian missionary who looked after lepers in India for 30 years before he was murdered for his faith. There are so many stories of how people have made a huge difference in the lives of others because they've seen how living by God's ways cause us to treat people differently, causes us to see these things differently and the world is better off as a result. One of the interesting ways that we can look back over is the area of reconciliation, whether it's reconciliation between races, ethnicities, reconciliation between gender, male and female, or between people of different social standings. The kingdom of heaven works in a completely different way to the world when it comes to how people relate to one another and how relationships are healed from some of the things that have divided us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for example, Paul writes to Christians in Corinth, rich and poor, and talks to them about the way they celebrate communion and how important it is that they do that together as one family, where the rich aren't doing it in a different way to the poor, but they are actually being thoughtful and considerate of one another who together make up the body of Christ on earth. Similarly, in James chapter 1, the rich people are encouraged to delight in the fact that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of the kingdom of heaven, actually humbles them. It changes the perception that they are better than other people. We all come to faith in Christ. We come to participate in his kingdom in the same way, by hearing and receiving his truth. But similarly, those who are poor, those who are downtrodden, those who are used to thinking of themselves as being lesser, they are encouraged to delight in the fact that they have been exalted in the kingdom of God. They have been made children of God, co-heirs on an equal footing with everybody else. And so the kingdom of God brings us together where once we were apart because of our social position, because of gender, because of race, whatever the issue might have been. I just love to imagine what it would have been like, for example, for a slave in Rome. The Apostle Paul wrote to Christians in Rome and said, hey, practice hospitality. Um, make sure you share your possessions with one another and don't be afraid to associate with people of low position. That were the value, those were the values that Christians were to live by. Imagine being somebody who lived according to the rules of the culture at the time, where those in powerful position considered those of lesser position as perhaps unimportant, of whose lives didn't really matter. Perhaps they considered them to be their own possessions that could be spent on their gratification or entertainment or profit or whatever it might have been. And you might have had some slaves in your household that you didn't actually pay a lot of mind to apart from what they did for you. But imagine seeing some other wealthy citizen of Rome invite your slaves, who you really looked down on and didn't consider to be worth much, over for a meal. And when they did that, they treated them like they were family. They treated them respectfully and graciously and generously. Would have made you stop and think, what's going on here? 
And in fact, we hear of citizens in Rome and other places looking at the ways Christians did these kinds of things and going, this is terrible. This is making a mess of our society. But eventually, people realise the results of living like that are actually good for everybody. The values of Christianity took hold in a whole bunch of ways. One of the interesting ways that Christianity shaped the values of society was in terms of the protection of those who are powerless. You see, it was very normal when the church was first growing and becoming established uh, in that part of the world that um, infants who were not wanted for whatever reason would be left out, they'd be exposed to the elements, left for wild animals to find and devour or whatever the case might be. And perhaps somebody else might find them and if they wanted the child then they could take it. It was just a normal practice for children who weren't wanted to be left out in that way. In a place called Ashkelon, uh, there was an archaeological dig fairly recently and they discovered about a hundred bodies of infants that were just tossed into a sewer beneath what is thought to have been a brothel. Um, human life was pretty cheap. Um, the powerless didn't have a lot of protection. But Christianity changed that. And when it came to infants, uh, instead of just accepting the fact that infants could be thrown away because maybe their parentage was in doubt, maybe there was a deformity of some sort, maybe the family uh, didn't have a lot of money and didn't want to have to support another child, or maybe the inheritance of the oldest child was being protected, for whatever reasons, children were just being discarded. But Christians weren't okay with that. They operated by different rules. And so they let it be known that instead of being left out in the elements, that these babies could be left at Christian places of worship. And they would be housed, they would be adopted by families, or they would be cared for in the new thing that Christians were setting up at the time, which we now know as hospitals and orphanages, places where people who were poor and vulnerable were being cared for. And it completely changed over time the attitude of the culture. It took several centuries, but eventually the practice of discarding babies became less and less common, eventually being outlawed. So we can see in these few examples ways that people, when they came into a relationship with God through Christ, when they became a part of his kingdom and lived by his ways, that the results, not only for them, but for all those who their lives touched, were great. A bit like yeast worked through dough and produces a great loaf of bread. These Christians, living according to the principles of the kingdom of heaven, made life better, not just for themselves, but for everyone. It's little surprise then that many people seeing the way that Christians live, even though at first they were criticised and persecuted, over time people saw the goodness of that way of life and began to agree that many of these rules were good rules. And so people increasingly adopted the rules of the kingdom of heaven without necessarily having a relationship with the king of that kingdom. And that's unsustainable. What we've seen happening in Australian culture is increasingly we're redefining the rules. Because we're not under the authority of a king, we're deciding for ourselves. Do we still think that the golden rule is the best way to live? Do we still think that what Jesus says about marriage and sexuality is the best way to conduct our marriages and our sexuality? We're starting to make our own rules and decide for ourselves how we want life to turn out because we are chasing results that we think will make us happier and more fulfilled as people. The rules of our culture are changing. We are in a post-Christian world. You can inherit a way of living. You can't inherit a relationship with God. We receive it through faith in Jesus. Increasingly, though, we want the kingdom without the king. And it just doesn't work that way. So what are we likely to see happening? At the moment, it's a little bit like what we saw in the parable of the Good Samaritan. That man knew enough of what was right and wrong that he stopped and helped the person who needed help. See, the Samaritans had built into their culture the laws of God. It's just they'd mixed it with a whole bunch of other things. So sometimes they would choose to live according to God's ways and sometimes they would choose to live according to other ways of living. And on this occasion, that man chose a great way to live. He lived by the right rule and the results were fantastic.
We're a bit like that in our culture at the moment. Sometimes, because we have a heritage in this country of knowing right and wrong, good and evil, we have a heritage of learning about what God says makes life work and what leads to good results for people. Sometimes people will choose to live out of what we have inherited. Sometimes we choose compassion and empathy and generosity. And it's not because that's just a natural way of living. Just look around the world at what comes naturally to people. It's not the same everywhere. But because of our heritage as a culture of having good rules that have set the tone for society, we often see people choosing to do things that are really good. And where sometimes we think, oh, well, we don't need religion then because we've got good rules and people make good choices. The reality is, as we have turned our back on the one who has given us those rules, we will move increasingly further away from those rules. And whether it's in areas like marriage and sexuality or how we protect the powerless or any other area of life, as we move further away from Jesus as our king, we will move further away from the standards he gave us to live by. That's both terrifying and a really wonderful opportunity. It's terrifying because God knows what is best and the rules that he gives us to live by are good rules. Regardless of how much we might want to do our own thing, when we submit ourselves to God's ways, especially if you have a relationship with Jesus as Lord and the help of the Holy Spirit, when you do what God says, it leads to blessing. He knows what he's talking about. And as we think we know better and make different rules for ourselves, over time we will see results in the lives of people which are damaging. We will see disasters playing out in individuals, in families and in society as a whole because we have lived by the wrong sets of values. We're operating by the wrong rules. And that's going to be tragic for us to be a part of. There are going to be so many sad stories and we will have to see those playing out. But the positive thing is that for those of us who are in a relationship with Jesus, who are listening to his word and living by his ways, increasingly our lives are going to look very different because we are operating by different rules. And like those early Christians, we'll come in for our fair share of criticism and mockery because people will look at the rules of the kingdom and go, that sounds like rubbish to us. But just like in the early church, over time people will see the results of those rules. They will see that living with Jesus as your king, living with the help of the Holy Spirit, leads to a better way of life. It's attractive. And that makes the message of the kingdom attractive. In the past, Christians have kind of been a bit camouflaged because most people understand that when the Bible speaks about good and evil, it knows what it's talking about. And so we're kind of playing by the same rule book. But increasingly, we will be playing by completely different sets of rules. And it will become clear what the results of those rules are. There's a huge opportunity if we don't conform to the pattern of this world, but we're transformed by the renewing of our minds and we live according to the rules of God's kingdom. I wonder what that will look like for you. I wonder if you've decided in advance that Jesus can be trusted to tell us the right way to live. That we ought to, as members of his kingdom, take the time to find out what he says and put it into practice in our lives. Not only will that bless us, but that will bless everybody who is watching our life. I wonder if you've realised that, you know what, we're probably not going to win many arguments about topics like these. But because people are watching our lives, they will get to see the results of what we believe. And those results will speak clearly about the goodness of our King. Is that what your life is looking like? Is that the, the desire of your heart, that you would not just fit in, but that you would shine brightly, as the book of Philippians says, as you hold out the word of God? I pray that that's your experience. I pray that you won't give in to fear as our society becomes more and more hostile to our way of living, but that you will see it as an opportunity. As long as God's people live by God's ways, the world will be a better place. People will see the kingdom is good and by the grace of God, they may even choose to live under the rule of our good king themselves. God bless you.